Hello and welcome to episode 28, guys. We've made it. Uh, we had such a high point last week with the marvellous face-off. And this week we will be looking at 1998's City of Angels. No taste to party. Um, <laughs> I know nothing about this film. Let's get those rules out of the way. So to watch these films, two rules. No distractions, no expectations. They're pretty simple and they go a little like this. No distractions, phones, laptops, whatever, being ignored. The outside world does not exist as far as I'm concerned when I am watching a Nicolas Cage film. Um, and no expectations. So I know nothing about this film apart from the fact that uh, Nicolas Cage is in it, Meg Ryan is in it, and the cover looks pretty shit. Uh, but apart from that, I know nothing about it. I know nothing about uh, IMDb scores or how it, how, I don't, I, don't, I don't even know opinions from other people. Um, all I do know about this film is, uh, it's not so much about what happens in the film or anything like that. Um, someone, I put it out to Twitter. If anyone had any questions or comments about Nicolas Cage or like just had a comment about this film and, um, Thomas W. Hunter on uh, Twitter responded with this anagram, which is amazing. Uh, follow his page, which is Thomas underscore W underscore Hunter. And um, yeah, he said, just to let you know, City of Angels is an anagram of cage is not fly. So maybe that is an anagrammical way of letting us know that we're not in for a good time, guys. But... Only time will tell by watching this film, digesting it, letting it seep under our skin, letting it ooh, work its way through. And then it goes up into my brain, formulates stupid sentences, and then comes back out of my mouth and could be absolute babble. Like, I was thinking today, about last week's episode, that um, it must have been so confusing for people. I'm not sure... How I ta like if the way I tackled when they switched faces made any fucking sense. If it didn't, or if it did, please let me know uh, on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at Caged In Pod. Uh, that would be great. Or shoot me an email, which is cagedinpod at gmail dot com. That's all of that kind of housekeeping. Housekeeping out of the way. Um, I'm just going to go to a few questions like on for last week's episode as well. I'd asked uh, people for questions. I probably put it out a little bit late. I should probably start putting that out at the beginning of the week. Or I'll just say, if you're a regular listener, I will take any cage-related questions or I will take any comments you have about the film. If they are comments about the film, maybe write a disclaimer. So like if it's any plot points or anything like that. Uh, if it is, email it to me and that would be the best way to do it because then I can read them after I've watched the film. So there's nothing, nothing's getting ruined or anything like that. And obviously on the social medias, I'll let you guys know when I'm watching the film. Sometimes I watch these films the day of record. Um, obviously I do the intros before because I want to be genuine with you guys that um, I am, I genuinely, when I record these intros, I know actually nothing about the films. So I don't want to be like, oh, I know nothing about it. And literally I've, I've watched it. It's already, it's already in me. Cage has already dug him, dug him in. But on to the questions I received. Um, the first one is from those movie guys. Uh, I believe Phil over there runs their Twitter. So this might be from Phil. Uh, maybe he consulted Joe. I'm not sure. The lovely Joe who um, featured on the Trapped in Paradise episode, which if you haven't listened to, was really fun. Um, or... You can always hold it back for around Christmas because it's a lovely Christmassy film. I probably will be watching it again around Christmas, so um, that might give you a little hint as to what I thought about that film. Um, so the question is, which cage is the real creep? Cast the Troy or Sean Carter, uh, Sean Archer being cast the Troy? Sorry, I said Sean Carter there. Uh, he's not pretending to be Jay-Z at all. He's pretending to be John Travolta's character, Sean Archer. Um... Probably should have done some prep on this, but obviously the real cast of Troy is really fucking creepy with his, like, suck my tongue and his whole peach speech. But, I don't know, I think 
Sean Archer being cast of Troy is <laughs> it's probably more probably because we get more screen time of him. I think it's the whole weird like face rubbing thing and the meltdown. The meltdowns he has, he's just, he's super creepy. Like, when he pulls the grimace at Sasha, that's that's weird. And um, when <laughs> when he has, like, the meltdown when um, Sasha's son, he kind of sees him as his own. Yeah, sir. Let's go with that. Yeah, it's Sean Archer being cast of Troy. That's that question answered. And the other question is... Um, John Travolta's best villain role, even if it was a part of this movie. Um, no, it's not. His best villain role is um, Danny Zuko in the film Grease. Because um, let me let me explain this. Um, the theory goes as this: that the whole film is a kind of Jacob's Ladder scenario. In that, Sandy is dead and she actually drowned when they met on the beach making John Travolta the biggest villain ever because he did not save her because he had got what he wanted he took her virginity and now he <clears throat> he does not care for her he's just going to let her die then the events that play out throughout the rest of the film are um that in the dying moments and obviously the car driving up into the sky is her ascending to heaven obviously not realizing that the man she had fallen in love with over that summer is a disgusting vile scumbag um <laughs> i read that theory online and i thought that would be a good way to do it no i did think that john travolta's uh villain in this film is pretty fucking great um that question came from Oh No Lit Class Podcast. Um, I haven't listened to those guys, but thank you very much for the question. Uh, again, anyone else wants to ask a question for next week's episode? Um, next week will be... Oh, fuck. <laughs> well, even if you want to make a comment about um, this film... City of Angels, if you've seen it, that would be great. Or if you want to even shoot me a line about next week's one, which will be Snake Eyes, which is a fucking gem. I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that film. So yeah, I'm looking, <laughs> I look forward to that one. It's uh, directed, from what I remember, the great Brian De Palma. So. I will very much be looking forward to that. And I will be looking forward to hearing you guys ask me questions or have your comments on the film. So um, enough of all this. Uh, let's just get raging with a cage. Nick Cage. I want to welcome everybody to the Caged In Pod Nicholas Cage, yeah, the one true god I've never seen this movie, so it's time to get groovy And see if it moves me No distractions, no expectations Over the weeks, hear my frustrations This is episode 28 Released on a Tuesday, we'll never be late uh, I guess the podcast is about to begin I'm your host, Petrus Vassilovus, and I'm Caged In and welcome back, guys. I have just watched 1998's City of God. Maybe you have as well. I'm not sure if many people watch along, but um, obviously you can. You can just pause the podcast after every time I do the little intro and the little music starts, whatever. You can watch along. You can you can laugh along to the, to the insanity that is Nicolas Cage. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you guys have 
a death wish as well, like myself, if you want to push the um, boundaries of your sanity to the breaking point and beyond. Um, so I feel like I'm doing at times. Uh, yeah, well, what is it? We've got two more episodes after this, and then we'll have a little check in and see if my fucking brain has started to implode yet, which I inevitably believe it is. One day will. Um, This film uh, was directed by Brad Silberling. I think I'm pronouncing his um, surname right. Um, He's had quite a short career, really. Well, not not so much short, but like very spread out career. Um, He started off his career in films directing Casper. You'll know that as the Casper, the Friendly Ghost, the Christina Ritchie, Bill Pullman film from 1995. Uh, This film, in a way, feels like a spiritual sequel, in a way. Um, Not in the way that it involves ghosts or anything like that, but it has that idea of kind of someone a haunting of some type, but like not in the malevolent evil kind but more of a like casper's title casper the friendly ghost you could almost see nicholas cage's character seth in this as a kind of spiritual spirit figure that is just out for the good um probably yeah let's just get into what actually happens in this film. So this film opens up with a mother who is oh, looking after a very sick daughter. She's taking her temperature and you noticed in the corner, well, you didn't know, oh, yeah, you noticed that in the corner, uh, Nicolas Cage is sitting there. Um, kind of is alarming to begin with because like, uh, is he a family member? But the mother doesn't seem to notice him. He's dressed in all black. He kind of looks like he is a... Um, yeah, he looks like a bit of a bit of a goth, bit of a weirdo. Um, it is quickly shown to be though that he is an angel because as the girl is rushed into hospital, he is there waiting above her. He is there to hold her hand to the afterlife. Um, and when she inevitably does die, he asks her a question of, "What was your favourite thing about being alive?" And she said, "I really liked pajamas." And that's a brilliant answer. I also like pyjamas. Yeah, I like being comfortable. It's nice, isn't it? Uh, And then we get a scene of Nicolas Cage's character, Seth, and a fellow angel played by Adrian Brower of um, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He plays Raymond Holt, uh, a very fantastic stand-up performance he does in that show. But in this, yeah, he plays a kind of Seth's partner in crime when it comes to going around being an angel. Um, And then there's a kind of montage of just... It's not really set up at this point, like, what the deal is with the angels. And it's kind of... um, The music kicks in and we see three just guys all dressed in black walking on top of a building for no apparent reason. It all has very, like an 80s like Duran Duran music video vibe about the whole thing and the music kind of reflects that uh, and then we get a scene of just shit load of these angels stood upon a beach and um, Seth and Raymond Holt I'm gonna call him Holt because I can't I can't I don't even remember if the character's name is said in the film but if it is i don't remember it sorry guys (laughs) just watch this film as well um they have a poignant conversation about the little girl and he asks maybe he could like make her an angel and he's like it doesn't work like that you're not born you're not turned into an angel you just are an angel and um he's like maybe i could just make her wings out of paper or something like that and says um What's the point of wings if you can't feel the wind on your face? Which is, a, I thought it was quite a nice line uh, to kind of, I don't know, start this film off. It kind of gave me high hopes at this point that this was going to be um, maybe a moving film, maybe an emotional film, maybe not complete dog shit. Um, we'll come on to my theory about the film after we discuss 
what the fuck happens? Um, then we see Meg Ryan just speed it along through traffic on her bike to work at a hospital. Uh, as soon as she gets there, you, kind of, you begin to realise that she is a surgeon and one of her fellow colleagues is saying, the patient wants to see you. Before he goes under, he wants to see you. Kind of imagine some reassurance that things are going to go okay. Um, she does so. She covers her. She covers her mouth and like her nose. Um, because my, pretty much all of her face. I guess this is a standard practice in a hospital for germs and stuff like that. I'm not. I don't know, guys. Um, I'm just an idiot who makes podcasts. I do not work in a hospital, and clearly, I'm not intelligent enough to be a surgeon. Um, everything seems to be going all well and perfect and as she exits the operating room we see that Nicolas Cage is in the doorway which from what we have seen so far is not a good sign for this gentleman um and then that's it she is back in to operating it gets to a point where she is manually pumping the guy's heart trying to get him to stay alive because every other form of like shocking him back in or whatever like yeah oh, ecgs again whatever they try everything to get him back and it just does not work and she is left with his unbeating heart in her hand and this sends her into a spiral of depression um, about her job and can she fix anything but during the moments of panic and stuff like that, there is a moment during the surgery where it seems as though she locks eyes with Nicolas Cage's character, the angel. Um, but we learn from the law that that, that that can't be a thing because angels are only seen by those who are dying or if they choose to present themselves to people. Um, and whilst the man is dying... He and Seth, the angel, look upon his dead body and see that they are trying their hardest to keep him alive, giving him those last moments before he ascends to heaven. I guess that's, that's what they're that's what they're trying to tell us that everything was done and he can kind of live on or die on as <laughs> happy as can be. Um, she then has to tell the family that her, their husband and father has died and this further sends her down a route of just feeling terrible about her job about like what yeah what the fuck are you supposed to do is there anything more she could have done um again Seth is there um and then Seth talks to Holt again and asks him, has he ever been seen by anyone? And he's like, no, because we're not. this is when the law is set up. that You can't be seen unless you show yourself to someone. And Seth says he believed that he was seen in that operating room. He then asks Holt if he should show himself to Meg Ryan's character to help her. And he's um, he responds to him, maybe you shouldn't, you can help her in other ways. They seem to like touch people on the shoulder and stuff like that, almost like a divine touch to help them along their way. Um, I don't know, I guess, I just said divine touch, I'm not sure if that is a real thing or if they just uh, made that up. Um, and this conversation is going on inside of a convenience store which is being robbed and what each of them place their hand on the store clerk and the robber alike and this seems to as i said this divine touch diffuses the situation and just kind of makes everyone feel a little bit more relaxed and a little bit easier about the thing and nobody's going to die <laughs> then we get um we find out that meg Ryan's character's name is maggie um i understand that because that's this is the first time in my notes where I wrote the name Maggie instead of Meg Ryan. So she is sick at work and then is told by um, Dr. Lover, uh, a guy who seems to be both a fellow doctor and her lover, that she can't operate because it's procedure. If you've been sick, you're not allowed to be touching no bodies. And then... Um, 
she asks him, do you believe that there are other people working with us? Kind of alluding to the idea that maybe there is a higher power working with them. Um, and throughout this kind of cage is just lurking about like he looks like a real fucking creep like it's like adorned in all black just kind of hangs around in a library we always find out i think he's pretty reading loads of edgar Allan poe and ya novels loves a bit of the uh, loves twilight you know like oh loves loves I don't know, Marilyn Manson. Oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> um, yeah, and he's hanging out at the library. You kind of see him, like, just looking over. That's another weird thing about this. As an angel, he just kind of seems to look over people's shoulders when there's no one dying, just kind of lurking about um, in other people's lives. We kind of see a scene of Maggie having a hard time at work again. Seth is lurking about. He just um, does a lot of lurking while she's trying to do a little bit of working. Um, then Seth follows Maggie through a children's ward and there is a moment where she puts her hand up against the glass and he has his hand on the other side and it's almost as if he's saying, if only you could see me. Um, but you can't because I'm just the creepy angel who's following you about. Um, Maggie then bumps into a paediatric doctor who has a problem with a baby that they can't seem to figure out what is wrong with it. And then they go on to the fact that Maggie does not seem right. And she says, maybe I should become a paediatric doctor instead of being a surgeon, because things seem to be Real shit. To which the paediatric doctor replies, never date a guy. Um, yeah, and talk about all you meet in uh, paediatrics are married men or gynecologists. And she says, never date a guy who knows more about your vagina than you do. I wrote that line down because I thought it was great. Um, yeah, kind of broke the, the tension of just like kind of uh, uh, very like, morose and i don't know very serious tone this film seems to be taking so far i uh yeah all these kind of moody shots of men all dressed in black standing on a beach watching sunset it's like oh fuck off and read some jd salinger you knobs upon leaving the hospital this is when seth reveals himself to Maggie and asks her, are you in despair? Um, and he's just super creepy. <laughs> and he like, say, he like says he's like one of the, uh, he's a visitor for someone and she's just, I don't know, he's just super creepy. And I just thought, like, why is she not freaked out by this weird guy hanging about at the hospital? Um, and, like, Seth hears her thoughts and that she, like, she's like, oh, why, why, didn't, why didn't he ask me out? Why didn't he, like, give me his number? And it's like, what the fuck? And then it cuts to Maggie in the bath rubbing herself, like, like her body with a cold bottle of beer. And it looks overly sexual, like she is having sexual fantasies about this angel man. Um... And I, yeah, I've written down in my notes, does she want to fuck a creepy angel? Which is uh, weird. And that night, Seth is there in her apartment, like, without her knowing. Uh, which is one of my, I don't know, I feel that there is a um, a big problem with this film and that, that, uh, I don't know, it's pretty, it's pretty fucking weird. Um, I'll come on to my theory once I've, explained everything that happens in this film um that night maggie tosses and turns and she can't sleep and then she picks up a copy of a movable feast by ernest hemingway and starts reading it and then the next day she strolls into work like a new woman her problems are solved she's happy again about her job and she goes straight 
to Dr. Lover and tries to give him back his book. But he has no idea about it. He's like, no, I didn't leave that book at your apartment. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So Maggie then decides to go to the library and they're trying to investigate the book. They're saying, well, well, we can't actually give you who got the book out, but we can tell you when it was taken out as if that would make any difference. But um, she goes to look for the Ernest Hemingway section and surprise, Sir fucking prize who is there lurking amongst the books is... Oh, creepy angel, Seth. Um, And he then reads a quote from, um, I assume it's an Ernest Hemingway book about oysters going into vivid detail about how they taste. And he, again, seems like a real weird guy. She asks about what he does, and he says he's a messenger. And she's like, oh, well, like... um, do you like like a bike messenger or something like that? He's like, no, I'm a messenger of God. Um, as if I don't know. As if by now, like his the fact that he's just turning up wherever she is is not creepy enough. Um, the fact that he's saying this type of shit, and then he then touches her hand, and then all of the angels that some for some reason hang out in the library all just watch as he touches her hand, and then he says. Let's get out of it. Let's go do anything. And they go on a date of sorts to what looks like a grocery market. And he gets her to explain the taste of a pear. I am would have loved it if <laughs> it was a peach, which would have been a lovely throwback to both Face Off and um, Wild at Heart. But... Brad uh, spelled blinder. It's definitely not the director's name. Or the writer of this film did not have enough foresight to put an ounce of humour in this. Uh, (laughs) She then takes him to the hospital and shows her his blood in a microscope. And she asks to take his blood for obvious reasons. He can't give it because he's an entity that does not live and breathe like the rest of us he does not he can't feel he can't taste that's why he's so thingy to that's why he's like so adamant to kind of know all about the taste and is obsessed with everything and can't even see in color um they then talk about what happens after death and she explains that there might be more to like things that she she, does, she can't really she can't really put her finger on it. Um, he then gets to her to explain why people cry. And she goes down the very scientific, specific route. Um, I don't know. It kind of... It feels like a lot of this stuff, like these conversations, don't really lead anywhere and just make Seth seem like a real creepy weirdo. Um, she then runs out and gets... She gets paged. And one of her patients... Mr. Messenger can't breathe. Um, she like she says to Seth to wait there, but obviously he can move wherever the fuck he wants. Uh, he then, once she leaves, touches Mr. Messenger and he says, I can't see you, but I know you're there. Um, tell them I'm not ready to go yet. Talking about the angels and... Yeah, it's like a moment where you're like, oh, fuck. How does he know? (laughs) Maggie then goes home to Dr. Lover, and he is adamant that they go camping to Lake Tahoe. He just wants to get the fuck out of the city and have some time to chill out. Um, And then she says something that's, again, quite peculiar. She's like, let's just look at each other. For five minutes, be in the moment. <laughs> and um, I don't know, this film is just so like po faced and serious that, like, I just like you don't realize how ridiculous the subject matter is, guys. Stop taking yourselves so, so seriously. Um, after that, Seth then shows himself to Mr. Messenger, not in the way of like getting his dick out or anything like that, as in like just revealing himself to be, ooh, 
I'm an angel. Um, he seems like Mr. Messenger seems to know all about the angels and like the ways of them and stuff like that. And then he's like, let's get out of here. Let's go to a diner. Over a meal, they discuss that uh, Mr. Messenger's name is Nathaniel and he used to be an angel who has fallen and explains how this happens. Says so you decide and you just fall and then you are human. You can experience everything that a human does. And um, he says humans are lucky because they have free will. Um, we then see that Maggie can't sleep that night. I guess something's plaguing her. Some feelings, some unnatural. Probably the fact that there's a creepy guy following about all over the fucking place. Um, then we see another scene of just like... <laughs> there's loads of really crap like green screen scenes of characters who are angels or used to be angels just sitting on top of really tall structures and this is one of them nathaniel and seth are sat above a on like a construction site and he says he got a job in construction so obviously not having any paperwork or anything like that it's hard to get a job after just becoming from becoming an angel to a human um he says he worked on construction because he's used to the heights um and he says that there are other people who have fallen and he said the reasons he had done it is because he has he can have a family um and he says how he can't explain it to his wife and like nobody just believes in angels anymore that's why like he doesn't want to you don't want to put people through that like thing of that angels exist because it's just too much hassle to burden that upon them um and he says do they still do it and then seth takes nathaniel to the weird angel sunrise ceremony on the beach where they all just stand there and watch the sunrise all of them dressed in black looking creepy as fuck um nathaniel's like I can't see or I can't hear the music you guys hear when it's like the sunrise. But again, you can't feel this and then strips off naked and swims in the sea. And Seth joins him, but obviously he can't he can't really feel it. He's just there just in case he drowns, I guess. Um, Seth then explains like again, sat sat somewhere with uh, Holt and explains how to fall. He says like, oh, I'm thinking of I might, I might do it, mate. Uh, <laughs> Seth, again, when Maggie is walking a dog, just turns up out of fucking nowhere. Um, and then he, um, yeah, again, why is she not worried about the fact that this guy is like, seems to definitely be following her. Um, they have a conversation and they end up kissing, but he seems to just feel nothing. And you can see it on his face. She's like, fuck this. I want to be with a guy who, uh, he feels something when I kiss him. Um, Maggie goes to <laughs> Mr. Messenger's birthday party. A pretty weird scenario for a doctor-patient relationship, but I don't know. I, who am I? Who am I to say? Um, and Seth is there, and we see that in a Polaroid photo, Seth does not appear at all. He is just a mass of white light, and Maggie sees this and looks a bit concerned um when they go back to her apartment she questions him on his past like about his family what his surname is and he just plucks something out of the air because he's in a kitchen it says my surname is plate <laughs> and then he accidentally cuts his hand but nothing happens the knife just glides through his hand she notices this so tries to purposely cut his hand and then it is revealed that nothing happens to him and he tries to explain that he is an angel and she is like get the fuck out of here and he's like but i love you she's like still get the fuck out of here you creepy angel bastard and at this moment i was like finally she has seen him for the weird creepy guy he is that he's just hanging around all the time angel or not He's still a creep. Um, Seth and Holt are on the wing of a plane. And then we kind of get a montage of Seth being sad. Maggie being sad. Um, 
I thought this was quite near the end. I uh, like looked at how long was left, and we had an hour to go, guys. But um, don't worry, I'm gonna rattle through this. It's a uh, not a lot really happens in this hour. Um, Seth creeps into her house at night when she she's like, "I know you're there. Just please hold me, hold me till I sleep." Um, he doesn't reveal himself to her. He just hangs around in his kind of ghostly state as opposed to his human you can see me state yeah the guy's weird (laughs) she wakes feeling great rushes to the hospital and says i think what's wrong with that baby from earlier it's got a blocked nose and she's like i just knew it uh (laughs) and i guess that Seth has done something or given her some insight by hugging her. Um, Dr. Lover comes to congratulate her and proposes to her. And the way he does it is mental. He is like some weird clinical robot. It's kind of like, will you marry me? Be my wife. (laughs) And he even admits himself. So, you know, I am not good with human emotions. (laughs) I am not programmed that way. And she definitely seems a bit dubious. And he's like, "Ah, let's think about it, mate. Let's not rush into this. Um, Maggie then does a check up on Nathaniel. And he explains how Seth could fall. Um, She asks, how do you know this? And because he says, because I did it revealing to her that he used to be an angel as well. Maggie then goes to the library to talk to Seth, and you think, oh, great, it's going to be the big moment. They're going to get together. He's going to fall. They're going to fall in love, and things are going to be fantastic. No, she goes to tell him that she's going to get married to Dr. Lover, and goodbye. Seth then looks real moody on the top of a construction site, and then throws himself off the fucking building. And when he awakes, not just does he awake to be a human, he awakes to be the nutty cage we know and love. And it was a moment, like, throughout this film, he has just seemed subdued and boring and like, I know probably Nicolas Cage is trying to go in a new direction, do something a bit different to what he's used to, but it was just boring. And it is in this moment he's kind of running about, being wild, looking like, just doing weird noises and stuff like that. He then tries to find the county hospital, I guess because he doesn't know regular forms of travel anymore. He kind of just appears places, doesn't know, I don't know. You would have thought if he'd lived for an eternity, he would know the geography of places. That's something he would have figured out, considering he knew every language and just knew so much about everything. But no, just regular geography and how to travel about a city. He has no fucking idea. The way he figures out how to get to the hospital is he chases an ambulance. Uh, He gets there and then finds out that Maggie has gone to Lake Tahoe. And he is like, no, this means she is going to get married to Dr. Lover. Um, He then tries to hitchhike, gets beaten up, kind of starts to see that being a human might not be that great. And then is given a ride by a trucker with a basset hound. Um, The fact he had a basset hound doesn't really have any relevance on the story. I just thought... Oh, it's a really cute basset hound. That's real nice that that guy's giving him a lift. Um, He turns up at her door and asks, you think, is it too late? And she's like, no, I didn't marry that dickhead. Don't worry. And she says, I'm in love with you, Seth. Um, She asks, what's happened? And he says, free will, baby. I think I might have added on the baby, but... That's, I, that's what that's what I heard anyway. That's that's how it should have been. Um, they then make love in front of a roaring fire, and she gets him, I guess, to describe what sex is. Um, this film is rated twelve uh, in the UK. I guess that would be like a PG thirteen. Uh, it's a very like 
sex, like, I don't know, a very passionate sex scene, yet they can't really show much because obviously it's not, yeah, it's not like a 15 or an R-rated movie or anything like that. Um, And it's weird. The way he describes it, uh, I guess maybe she's getting to describe what her vagina is like. He describes it as warm and aching. I'm not sure if that's the sex or the vagina um, or his penis. I I am not sure. The next morning, they embrace by the lake and just kind of like, oh, you're like oh, they're an idyllic setting. They finally found love. They can be together. And he says he always used to ask people when they died what their favourite part about life was. And then now when he is asked, he will say this moment right here. And she says, don't worry, we'll have the rest of our lives together. I've got so much to show you it's all gonna be okay he then goes for his first ever shower and we kind of get scenes of him experiencing things for the first time that he'd never experienced obviously the touch of hot water eating food she goes for a bike ride and she crashes her bike into a lorry full of logs and at the exact moment this happens a candle blows out in front of Seth and he knows something is wrong maybe some of his angel-like instincts have followed him over to his earthly body and he rushes down to miraculously know where the accident has happened and he finds her and spends her last moments with her and she says I'm not afraid to die so I can see someone is like is this what happens when I die and he's like oh, don't don't take her please don't take her um then we kind of get the cl- a classic a bird's eye view of a funeral in the rain um He's hanging out with Nathaniel, obviously a man who kind of knows the feeling of falling and to be a human after being an angel for so long. Um, He buys a fuckload of pears at the groceries, at the grocery market. Um, Seth argues with Holt as to, like, what happened? Why was she taken? Is this punishment for him falling? Was it him who was there when she died? Um... And then he, like, is asked by Holt, was it worth it? And he says, to fill one breath of her hair, to have one kiss on her lips, to have one skip on her rope, to have one this of that, to have to have one, one sip of her tea, to have one flip of her flop, to have would be worth g- falling... The fact that she's no longer there, like, it doesn't matter. The fact that he got to to feel those, like, emotions and feel those feelings and just experience life for that short amount of time, experience love, what it's truly like. And I imagine the fact that he got to blow his load was probably great after living all that time as a little angel man. Um... He then goes to the beach at the weird sunrise and takes a swim in the sea um, because he can feel the waves crashing down upon him that he could never feel before. Holt looks upon him and is laughing as all of the creepy angel guys are doing their morning ritual of staring at the sun. Then the film fades to black and that is the end guys um i have a slight problem with this film and my problem is as goes um it seems to be a film about a guy who like regardless of being an angel is a neglectful worker who stalks a lady breaks into her apartment makes her feel so threatened that he that he's that he's he's kind of about and doing stuff that she to leave town to kind of get away from him. Um, he then uses emotional blackmail and fills her with like stories of a grandiose past and lulls her into a false sense of security and kind of 
facilitates a scenario where she's confused, upset, and acts neglectfully about traffic, hence causing her to die. Um, so, yeah, that is my problem with this film, that Seth is a weird creep who, even though he has, regardless, yeah, well, he has divine purpose, he just wants to throw it all the way. For the, I obviously get the idea that love is important over everything, but he's a man who works for a shady organisation, wears the same clothes every day, and just stalks ladies. He does not seem like a cool dude at all. Um, so, yeah, let's see what other people had to say about this. Let's have a little look online and see if this is a fucking masterpiece. So, the scores we have, let's look. Rotten Tomatoes. Give this film... 59% IMDB 6.7 out of 10 and Roger Ebert 3 out of 4 um I feel like that all of that is maybe a bit generous like this um I did a bit of reading and this film is actually a loose remake of a film by uh, I believe German director Wim Winders called Wings of Desire. And I just feel that this is very, it's very 90s. And it's very, it's just very, as I said, very po face and takes itself way too seriously. And there's just, I, I don't care about, I didn't care about any of the characters really. I didn't, I didn't care about the fact, I just found... Seth to be really, really fucking creepy. Obviously, I felt something towards uh, Maggie's character because obviously I imagine being a surgeon is a very, very tough job. Um, I felt that I felt that the kind of religious underpinnings of this film, like I couldn't see if it felt quite like pro-religious to me. Not that's not necessarily a bad thing, but like just. I don't know. It just kind of felt muddied. Like, obviously, my, my, my opinions are kind of pretty sounding a bit like that themselves. But it was, it kind of, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't sit well for me. Like, the portrayal of, yeah, that this angel would just throw it all away for this lady that is essentially stalked. It's not like there is a reciprocation, like, and... Just the relationship. It felt rushed. Like, this whole film felt like it took place over about five days. Like, there wasn't real sense of time passing at all. Like, I don't know. I, yeah. I didn't, I felt like there could have been a bit more into the explanation of... Ain't, like, that, that's such a cool, like, concept and idea of, obviously, angels just, like... Or these beings didn't necessarily have to be angels. It could have just been these beings that like watch over people and this is their law. But I felt like it could have gone way deeper into that stuff instead of the kind of creepy following a lady around her working life thing. I get that it's kind of trying to be... That's what I mean. It's that very nice thing of trying to do a spin on a romantic comedy and kind of trying to... And obviously the like, oh the dramatic ending with obviously he's made this sacrifice for her to obviously become a human and then it is snatched from him straight away is uh, like that I was like I could see it coming a mile off not just because that that scene was in such slow motion that like you, about a mile down the road you could see her oh no she's hurtling to, yep 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 she's hurtling towards that lorry and is going to die. Like, um, the moment I saw her on a bike that morning, I knew it was going to happen. Like, um, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't enjoy this one, guys. Uh, fuck. But hopefully, well, I know next week I pretty will enjoy it. 
a uh, lot more because I've actually seen Snake Eyes, and from what I can remember, it's a really fucking good film. <laughs> and if you have seen Snake Eyes, or if you have seen City of Angels, please get in touch if you have any comments about this film or have any questions about this film, or have any questions about um, Nicolas Cage in general, or any comments about Snake Eyes, please email them and put the subject heading as Snake Eyes so I can read your emails after I have watched the film and I will like kind of discuss any of those points on the podcast next week. Uh, the email address for that is caged in pod at gmail.com obviously all the social media is just for general chit chat and keeping up and seeing how we are doing is caged in pod uh no yeah at caged in pod sorry i said caged in pod at got it the wrong way fucking round um yeah it's at caged in pod and yeah it's facebook twitter and instagram on all of those um yeah rate and review if you want if like what <laughs> Apple Podcasts, like ACAR Stitcher, like whatever, but like check out um check out some other Nicolas Cage podcasts. Um sounds like a weird thing for me to do. Uh I know some other podcasts seem to be in um competition, which I I don't I feel is a bit weird. Um We're all doing yeah, we're all doing a, a similar thing, but we're all coming at it from different angles. So it's kind of fun for me and i guess it'd be fun for other people to hear varying interpretations of the same film that's what's so amazing about just film like film-based podcasts or anything like that like film reviewing and stuff is obviously everyone has different opinions and takes fit like takes away from things differently obviously i came in with the um, approach to this podcast that i was trying to see if these films made me insane i have the i have that thesis like other people go at it as fans um i'm just gonna list off a few of the other nicholas cage podcasts you should check out um one of them is a another uk based one which is um cage pod uh there's enter the cage there's into the cage there is heat seeking panther there is cage cast just check them all out let's let's just um yeah Let's just, at the end of it, once we've all watched all of them, we'll all just have a massive uh, Nicolas Cage circle jerk. It'll be amazing. We'll try and get him involved. Then we'll, we'll we'll go to the man to the right or left if you're left-handed, and we'll just all wank each other off, and it'll be it'll be great. And we'll have loads of pictures of Nicolas Cage everywhere, and it'll be, it'll be disgusting and filthy. So if any of you guys who are on any of those podcasts, or if any of you listen to those podcasts, please reach out to them to people and tell them that this is what is going to happen. A big, disgusting Nicolas Cage wank off. Um... I feel like that is an appropriate point to end the episode. <laughs> Leave you with that disgusting Nick Cage bukkake situation. Um, and I will catch you next week when we look at Snake Eyes. So as always, guys, I've been Petrus Pat Syllabus. I've been Caged In. You've been rad. Bye!